All right. Welcome in, everybody. Tuesday night, that means Bible study. So tonight is our final Bible study on the book of the Acts of the Apostles. We are going to finish the book tonight, uh, which is great timing because next week we start with Great and Holy Lent, which means we'll be very busy in church, uh, worshiping God in the various Lenten services, which uh, I'm very much excited about and um, will give us a chance to focus our attention on the Lord instead of studying the scriptures, but actually through our prayer and attendance of the, of the services. So uh, may, may God bless the Lenten season for all of us that it may be fruitful. Uh, tonight, just to recap where we're at, we're going to be tonight covering the last two chapters of Acts 27 and 28. So <clears throat> recapping uh, how we got here. Uh, at, in our last talk, we were, uh, St. Paul was a prisoner in Caesarea. So he had already been transported from Jerusalem to Caesarea. And he's been on trial multiple times. Uh, there was a change in governor. So now Festus is the, was the governor in Caesarea. And uh, St. Paul was put on trial again with Festus and the Jewish authorities. And St. Paul, seeing that he wasn't getting anywhere and that uh, his case was becoming more dire, uh, he appeals to Caesar, which as, as a Roman citizen was his right. And so he's sent by Festus on his way to Rome. Before going to Rome, though, he also stands trial again before King Agrippa, who was, if you remember, like the ethnarch, the people's king in Judea. Uh, he was king, basically, of the Jewish people. So again and again, what we've seen in these trials is that St. Paul is not guilty of any crime, certainly nothing worthy of death. And yet he's kind of just keeps getting passed down the, the ladder, you know, the chain of command. And now he's finally appealed to Caesar. So they have to send him to Rome at this point. You know, there's no, there's no other option. So even though they wish that they could release him, uh, they cannot. They have, to, they have to send him on to Rome. So that's where we left off and where we're going to be picking up here in chapter 27. So let's, let's dive right in. We're in chapter 27, verse 1. And when it was decided that we should sail to Italy, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners to one named Julius, a centurion of the Augustan regiment. So here we see again St. Luke using that we. That means that he's with St. Paul at this point. So this is eyewitness. This next you know, bit is going to be his eyewitness account. So entering a ship of Adramidium, we put to sea, meaning to sail along the coast of Asia. Aristarchus and Macedonia of Thessalonica was with us. And the next day we landed at Sidon. And Julius treated Paul kindly and gave him liberty to go to his friends and receive care. When we had put to sea from there, we sailed under the shelter of Cyprus, because the winds were contrary. And when we had sailed over the sea, which is off Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of Lycia. There the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing to Italy, and he put us on board. Uh, so basically what they're doing now, if you, can, if you know your geography, you have like the coast of Turkey, which kind of like makes a loop like that. And then the, the uh, Palestinian coast which is a north-south coast. So they're going north along the Palestinian coast up from Jerusalem and Caesarea. And they're going to make a turn west to go south of Turkey, modern-day Turkey, and then make their way like across to Crete and then make their way slowly to Italy. So that's what they're, that's what they're doing. Uh, so along the way, they stop. Uh, and St. Paul is actually allowed to like get off the ship and visit with people. So even this little details, right, shows that for the Romans, he's not like a dangerous criminal, right? If he was like a dangerous, if he was a dangerous person, they wouldn't have let him out of their custody. Uh, they would not have let him off the ship. He would have had to stay on the boat. So this, uh, even these little details show us that what St. Luke is trying to prove, which is that like St. Paul is not, not some criminal. He's an innocent man that's getting sent now before Caesar to, to trial before Caesar. Um, also, what we'll, what we'll note, I, nothing too like scripturally heavy but there's no like it's like now we take for granted right that if we want to go from one city to another usually we can go direct right you hop a plane you get from chicago to anywhere that's not how it was at that time like if you wanted to go from place to place many times they would you would have to travel with several ships to get basically like a little bit closer here a little bit closer there and finally to get to your destination so he's he's already taken out two different ships at this point uh, first the ship to Adramidium, and then they get to Mira, and then they find a boat from that's from Alexandria that's going to Italy. So that's the boat that they're going to take there, and then probably have to find another way up to, to Rome. 
Uh, so Mira was a trade center for wheat, and that's why there were frequent ships that were coming and going from Rome, because they were, they were there to bring the, the supplies of wheat to the Roman capital. Fun fact, Mira is where St. Nicholas was a bishop. So the, so B Nicholas, Bishop of Mira and Lycia, that's, this is the same town. It's the same city that we're talking about. So St. Nicholas, of course, is 250 years later, but this is the same places, you know, that St. Paul visited and was traveling through. This is where eventually where St. Nicholas will be a bishop, like the St. Nicholas. So now we're in verse uh, seven. When we had sailed slowly for many days and arrived with difficulty off Cnidus, the wind not permitting us to proceed, we sailed under the shelter of Crete off Salmone. Passing with difficulty, we came to a place called Fair Havens near the city of Lycia. Or Lycia. So they, instead of going north of Crete, for those again who know your geography, Crete is like basically like, a, think of like a candy bar. You know, it's like a, straight across, uh, east and west. So instead of crossing across the north part of Crete, which was a more direct path to Italy, we're going south of Crete to use the island as almost like a natural windbreaker because the wind was contrary to them. So now they're going a little bit out of their way. And Fair Havens, this place called Fair Havens is on the Southern coast of, of the island of Crete. <clears throat> if they would have gone directly, they would not have gone that way. So it shows us that the weather is not good. The weather's not cooperating with them and they're a little bit off course. And this is, means that it's taking more time to get to their final destination. And this is a problem because it's getting closer and closer to the winter, which would have made it very extremely dangerous to travel. Usually ships would not have traveled during the winter. So the fact that they're losing days now during their travels is not a good thing for them. Now, when much time had been spent and sailing was now dangerous because the fast was already over, Paul advised them saying, men, I perceive that this voyage will end with disaster and much loss, not only of the cargo and ship, but also our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion was more persuaded by the helmsman and the owner of the ship than by the things spoken by Paul. And because the harbor was not suitable to winter in, the majority advised to set sail from there also, if by any means they could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete opening towards the southwest and northwest and winter there. So the fast that's referred to here is either Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, which is in late September, early October, so like fall time or the fast preceding Hanukkah, which would have come later in the year in December. Either way, the idea is that the winter's coming, right? That things, the weather's not gonna cooperate for much longer. So there's a sense of urgency, right? They have to get somewhere safe so that they can at least be somewhere for the winter and so that their ship can make it through the winter time. And so they decide, a, a, a contrary to the advice of St. Paul, to go to try to make it to a port called Phoenix, which was on the Western end of the island of Crete, not very far from where they were. It's about 36 miles, which was better sheltered from the winter winds. So the, the owner of the ship and the, the driver of the ship, they say, oh yeah, we can make it. You know, the owner of the ship, of course, being a merchant, being a businessman, he wants to deliver his goods so that he can get paid, et cetera, et cetera. And St. Paul says, oh, I think if we leave, it's not gonna end well. Um, so he warns them about the potential danger, but they don't heed his words. This will come into play later when St. Paul starts giving more advice. They don't listen to him now, but once they see that he was right in his, his estimation, they'll start to take into more account the things that St. Paul has to say. And we'll see that he actually starts basically like running the show. He's like basically he's doing, you know, telling them what to do. So uh, keep, that, keep that in mind as we move forward. So we're in verse 13. When the south wind blew softly, Supposing that they had obtained their desire, putting out to sea, they sailed close by Crete. But not long after, a tempestuous headwind arose called Eurocliden. So when the ship was caught and could not head into the wind, we let her drive. And running under the shelter of an island called Clada, we secured the skiff with difficulty. When they had taken it on board, they used cables to undergird the ship. And fearing lest they should run aground on the Sirtis sands, they struck sail and so were driven. So things, things seem like they're going to go well, right? They, they set out and they're like, oh, the winds are good. You know, we're going to make it to where we want to go. But very quickly and very suddenly, as oftentimes happens on the, on the seas, um, things change. Uh, the winds change. They're, 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 
this seasonal wind called the Eurocliden comes and and basically starts to just beat the ship up. You know, this gale force winds, they're losing control of the ship. So the, it gets it gets to the point where, you know, the skiff, the skiff is basically like a lifeboat, right? Like think of like a lifeboat on a big ship. <clears throat> They're having to like attach it to the. Uh, they're having to like pull it on board and attach it to the ship because it's it's be it's just it's taking on water. It's 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 making the ship unstable. So with difficulty, they finally get that settled, and then they even have to like wrap cables around the boat to to like undergird the boat so that they can make sure, you know try to keep it and keep the integrity, the you know the the integrity of the ship intact. So it's there. You can tell that already they're they're worried about the safety of the ship. They're they're trying to protect it from being ripped apart by these horrible winds. Uh, furthermore, they're worried about running aground the Sirtis Sands. The Sirtis Sands is all the way on the co the northern coast of Africa, right? So this means that they're worried that they're going to get driven so far by this winds that they're going to make it all the way from Crete to like northern Africa, which is a quite a distance. I mean, it's not a small it's not a small distance. So uh, the weather turns against them and it's, it's not going well. And because we were exceedingly tempest tossed, the next day they lightened the ship. On the third day, we threw the ship's tackle overboard with our own hands. Now when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and no small tempest beat on us, all hope we would be saved was finally given up. So again, they're taking like, uh, safety precautions here. These are like emergency safety precautions. They're throwing things off the boat, right? They're first, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're lightning, they're throwing their cargo overboard, even, th even like the ship's equipment, anything that wasn't absolutely necessary was getting thrown overboard. They say with our own hands, meaning even like these prisoners and passengers were like helping to do it, right? To show like the urgency and that everything was going haywire. Um, so they're tossing all these things overboard. And they had to do this because the ship had taken on water. So the ship was getting heavier and heavier and sinking into the, into the ocean. And so to lighten the ship and bring it back up, they were throwing things you know, overboard. Um, but nothing they're doing is, is being particularly effective, right? And it becomes clear to them that the boat is not going to make it. And it says like that finally, any hope that would be saved is, was finally given up. And right there, we'll pick up in verse 21. We'll see, except for one person, right? We can guess who that one person is. But after long abstinence from food, then Paul stood in the midst of them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not have sailed from Crete and incurred this disaster and loss. And now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For there stood by me this night an angel of the, of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve, saying, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar. And indeed, God has granted you all those who sail with you. Therefore, take heart, men, for I believe, God, that it will be just as it was told me. However, we must run aground on a certain island. So St. Paul, he reminds them of his word. Remember we said, I said, keep in mind what he said here, right? So he says, you remember when I told you we shouldn't leave Crete, right? Like that was, that was a bad choice. You should have listened to me. So now let me give you more words and you should listen to me again. So don't lose heart, right? God, my God told me that we're going to, all of us will survive this. The ship will not survive it, but we will survive it. Not, no one will, no one will die. Uh, so we'll see now that they're going to start to, to listen. When St. Paul talks, so they're going to start to listen. The, in the beginning, he was kind of like, just like kind of uh, saying his, his piece. He was just kind of giving his opinion on whether they should leave Crete or not. Now he's speaking with authority, right? Now he's like, don't be afraid. This is, that's not a, that's not a, well, I think you shouldn't be afraid. That's a, don't be afraid. He's doing that because of the vision. He beheld this angel who told him everything that was going to happen. And notice here too, right? It, that it's not just it, it, the first, first of all, notice that the first time St. Paul said so, right? That there, he said, there will be a great loss of life if we leave Crete. Now the angel come has come and said, nobody will die. Not just you, but nobody with you either. What does this imply? that without God's intervention, there would have been loss of life, right? Without God coming and intervening in this situation, people would have died. But because St. Paul is there, because St. Paul needs to get to Rome, and because of who St. Paul is and who all his companions are, not only will God grant that St. Paul will make it there, but all those who are with him will also make it there. So, uh, so it, it shows us 
the grace of God, right? That, that um, not only will God protect St. Paul, but everyone on the ship as well. It shows, it shows how much, how powerful God's grace is to, you know, overturn the situation and preserve life. Um, that God through St. Paul will be preserving the life of all these people on board. And when we get, when we get later on, we'll see that it's like over 270 people. It's not like a few, it's not like a few people. It's a big, this is a big ship with a lot of people on it. So now we're in verse uh, 27. Now, when the 14th night had come, so two weeks, they're, they're being battered in the storm for two weeks. As we were driven up and down in the Adriatic Sea, about midnight, the sailors sensed that we were drawing near some land. And they took soundings and found it to be 20 fathoms. And when they had gone a little farther, they took soundings again and found it to be 15 fathoms. Then fearing we should run aground on the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for day to come. So what, are the, what the sailors here are doing is they're testing how deep the water is where the boat is. So they're dropping something into the, into the ocean that they can measure. And the first time is that it's 20 fathoms, which is about 120 feet deep. So that's the first measurement. So they let some time pass. And again, they're, they're, they're not controlling the ship at this point, right? The sail is down, the rudders are up, they're, they're at the mercy of the wind and the waves. So <clears throat> they wait a little bit. They drop, the, they drop it again. They find that it's only 15 fathoms, which is like 90 feet deep. So what does that tell them is that they're getting closer to land, right? That they're getting closer to, to making landfall. But it's night. They can't see anything, right? So they're worried that they're going to hit with, you know, out of control, that they're going to hit something and the boat's going to sink and they're all going to die. So they drop the anchors trying to slow the ship down so that they can delay and stall so that the morning will come and they will at least be able to see where they're at and how far from land they are. So that's what they're doing here. You can see again and again, they're like doing all these emergency safety procedures and nothing is working, you know? Uh, so they, they at least realize that they're getting close to something. They don't know where. St. Paul's already told us that they have to run, they have to run on ground at some island, but they don't know where yet. And as the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship, when they had let down the skiff into the sea under pretense of putting out anchors from the prow, Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the skiff and let it fall off. So what's happening here? So you have, you have different groups on the ship, right? So you have the sailors. They're the ones that are working the ship. You know, they're the, the merchant, the, the captain of the ship, and all the crew. You also have the centurion with the Roman soldiers. That's the second group. And then you have the passengers, which are the prisoners, as well as anyone else who has paid to, for travel on this boat. So the sailors, they know, where, they know what's going on, right? They realize that they're getting closer to land. So their plan, their sneaky plan, is to take the skiff, which is now on the boat, right? To drop it into the water, to say, we need to drop the anchors on the back. And they've already dropped the anchors on the front saying, oh, we're going to go drop the anchors on the back and just leave, flee, right? They want to abandon, they want to sabotage and abandon the ship because they think they're, they're, they believe the ship is going to go down. So they're ready to go. St. Paul, St. Paul, he's not, you know, he's, he's wise to their plans. He knows what's going on. He tells the centurion, the leader of the Roman, the Roman soldiers, if you let them go, this boat's going to sink. That's basically what he tells you, right? If you let them go, we're doomed. So the centurion, the centurion orders his men, they cut the ropes off the skiff and the skiff just sails away. The sailors are stuck on the boat right now. So St. Paul and the centurion work together to stop the sabotage and the treachery of, of the sailors on, on the boat. So, uh, you know, St. Paul tells them, right, that if, if you do, if you let them do this, they're going to die. Notice again, right, though, the centurion, when St. Paul says it, he doesn't say, ah, yeah, whatever, St. Paul. He says, okay, cut the ropes, right? Like, listen to this guy. Listen to what he has to say, because when, when we listen to him, good things happen. So the, the centurion listens, and they cut the skiff. So now the sailors, are, they're stuck on the boat. So we're in verse uh, 33 of chapter 27. Again, you see all these details, because St. Luke was there. He's telling us his experience on the, on the ship. And as day was about to dawn, Paul implored them all to take food, saying, Today is the 14th day you have waited and continued without food and eaten nothing. Therefore, I urge you to take nourishment, for this is for your survival, since not a hair will fall from the head of any of you. 
And when he had said these things, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he, be he began to eat. Then they were all encouraged and also took food themselves. And in all, we were 276 persons on the ship. So when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship and threw out the wheat into the sea. So uh, St. Paul is basically telling them here, like, our time on this ship is coming to a close. Take, you know, eat something now because you're going to need the strength for, you know, to make it to land. So he himself eats, you know, he eats and then everybody seeing his example follows what he's doing so that they can take strength. And they have such confidence in what St. Paul is saying that once they finish eating, they throw the rest of the food off the boat, right? Like, okay, St. Paul said that, you know, this is going to be done now. So now that we've all taken our sustenance, we don't need this anymore. And they throw it off. They throw it into the sea. Um, notice that again and again, right? Who's the one giving the, who's the one with that calm head giving the instructions that are keeping people safe? It's St. Paul, right? He's the one that's giving the people encouragement. <coughs> Excuse me. He's the one that's giving the instructions for the sake of the survival of everyone on board. In this case, he sets the example by eating food uh, so that the others will follow and have strength so that they can make it to land. Uh, even during this time of this tumultuous storm, two weeks, right? Can you imagine being two weeks on the just storm toss, two weeks on a ship? And not like the nice boats we have today, like an ancient ship, you know, it's not, you know, not a luxury uh, yacht, you know, this is their not safe conditions at all. After two weeks of being tossed around, right? St. Paul, what does he do? He takes the bread, he gives thanks. He says, he gives thanks to God. So I think this is a big lesson for us, right? That in our lives, we have to cultivate a spirit of gratitude. It's not something you have or you don't. It's something that you practice and develop. It's a skill. Being grateful is a skill, especially towards God. So if we are able to practice that gratitude, just like we'd say to pray every day and, you know, to, to fast, even the church tells us to fast and read the scriptures daily and give alms, like practicing gratitude is a part of the Christian life. And what that does is allows us to be grateful even in the difficult moments, to see God's activity, even when things are hard. And this is what St. Paul is showing us here, right? That he takes the bread, he gives thanks over it, um, even in this difficult moment. While this is not St. Paul celebrating the Eucharist per se, St. Luke is using Eucharistic language, right? He's using the language we talk about with communion, right? He took the bread and he gave thanks, right? And then he broke it, right? Those are all like when we talk about Jesus at the Last Supper, those are the, it's the same language that we use when we talk about Christ at the Last Supper, giving his, you know, the body and blood uh, of the Eucharist to his disciples. So what this also shows us, again, while not the Eucharist per se, right? This shows us that the church, the Eucharistic church, meaning the church, the one true church, the Orthodox church, survives the storms of persecution and difficulties and schisms and heresies and all these different things. It survives because of our connection to Christ in the Eucharist. That's what makes us the church. That's the foundation of the church, the cornerstone of the church. And it is because we have this connection with our Lord and Savior that the church survives so many difficult moments in its history. And when we think not just about, you know, heresies and schisms, but even in our, you know, in recent history, you know, like the, the Russian Orthodox Church surviving communism, and not just Russia, but Romania and Serbia and all these places, right? There were all these, all these countries where the Orthodox Church was persecuted in our times, right? Not like thousands of years, not like 2000 years ago. We're talking about 100 years ago. This was not that long ago. And yet the church now is flourishing in all these places. Why? Because there were people that were connected to Christ. So it shows us too, right, that we shouldn't lose heart. We should instead try to unite our life to Christ as intimately as we can so that we can survive and thrive and, and grow no matter what's going on around us. All right, verse 39. <clears throat> when it was day, so they made it to the morning time. They did not recognize the land, but they observed a bay with a beach onto which they planned to run the ship if possible. And they let go the anchors and left them in the sea, meanwhile loosing the rudder ropes. And they hoisted the mainsail to the wind and made for shore. But striking a place where two seas met, they ran the ship aground and the prow stuck fast and remained immovable. But the stern was being broken up by the violence of the waves. 
excuse me. So what St. Paul uh, foretold them to pass, the boat is completely stuck. Uh, they hit something. They're not at the shore yet. But they hit something and the boat is stuck in the in the in the in the sand there or whatever it is. And it's being just the boat is now being just crushed by the waves of the ocean and um is being destroyed. So now they have no choice. They have to abandon ship. If they stay on the ship, they're gonna die. And the soldiers' plan was to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim away and escape. But the centurion, wanting to save Paul, kept them from their purpose and commanded that those who could swim should jump overboard first and get to land and the rest, some on boards and some on parts of the ship. And so it was that they all escaped safely to land. So why did the soldiers want to kill the prisoners? Well, if, if a Roman guard allowed in a prisoner to escape, it was his head, right? The price of that was death. There was, that was capital punishment for that. So they're not willing to risk their own lives for the sake of these prisoners, right? So they're like, well, I'm going to just cover my bases here and we'll take care of this now so that there's no loose ends, basically. But the centurion had must have befriended Paul or knew that, you know, he had appealed to Caesar, whatever it was, whatever the case was. He did not want Paul to be harmed. And so once again, as we've seen through all these chapters, these late chapters in the Acts of the Apostles, is that God is using a pagan centurion, right, a pagan person, to protect St. Paul and advance his plans, right? Advance the will of God. Otherwise, if that centurion wasn't there, right? St. Paul would have been killed with the other prisoners and that would have been it. That would have been the end of the story. Instead, the centurion tells them to make for land. Uh, and so those who can swim, basically, he tells them to jump and make a, make, a, you know, make a break for it. And those who couldn't swim would use the parts of the ship because as we heard, the ship is being destroyed and by the waves. So they're going to grab whatever they can and float, you know, float to land. Interestingly, in, uh, in uh, Father Lawrence Farley's book, he notes that this place where they landed, which is on Malta, which we'll find out in just a few verses, came to be called St. Paul's Bay. So they, they you know, they, it was it was named, you know, the, the place was known and uh, it took eventually took St. Paul's name because uh, they made that's where they finally made land again. Uh, St. John Chrysostom in his writings, he, he gives us a couple of takeaway points for this chapter of the shipwreck, of uh, the storm and, you know, the, the ship and the storm and the shipwreck. He says, first of all, people should rely on God's help and not earthly things, right? So it was only because of the will of God that all these people were saved because it wasn't because of the strength of the ship or the skill of the, of the captain or of any other reason or good weather or whatever, right? The only reason they all lived was because it was God's will that they lived. So we shouldn't, you know, exclusively rely on earthly things, uh, but rather we should put our, put our faith and our trust in God. You know, think of everything that they survived in this chapter. You know, the shipwreck, the storms, the sabotage of the crew. You know, they never, they didn't crash into any rocks, right? The boat, the boat, if the boat had hit rocks, it would have sank immediately, right? They wouldn't have had any chance to escape. Uh, the soldiers planning to kill the prisoners, right? There was all these potential places where they could have been, they could have died. And yet in the end, they, they pulled through. And that was only because of God's grace. The second thing St. John Chrysostom relates to us and our takeaway point is, right, that the world, the world needs holy people, right? Because holy people like St. Paul, they protect the world through their prayers and through their intercessions. And they guide us to safety, not just physical safety, but spiritual safety through their holiness of life and through their wisdom. Uh, and thankfully, you know, we have so many examples, even in our own times, you know, we're, we're learning about all these holy men and women who are now being pronounced saints who live during our lifetime. You know, we just, I think we just had the first Saint of Menios, I think is the first saint who died in the 21st century, as the least of that I know. So we have people for sure that lived in our lifetime who are saints. So we know that there are holy people in the world and we need them. You know, we need their prayers and we need to stay close to them uh, so that we can not only survive the storms of, of the world, of the seas, but also so that we can survive the, the spiritual storms of life, which we oftentimes face. Um, so that's the end of chapter 27. So now they everybody has made it to safely to shore, miraculously. So chapter 28, verse 1. 
Now, when they had escaped, they found out that the island was called Malta. So Malta is an island south of Sicily in southern, southern Italy. And um, it shows us, too, how far off course they are. They would have never come that way if they were going to just kind of hug the coast of Italy and make their way up to Rome, which is on the western coast. Um, <clears throat> they're, they're way off. They're way off base at this point. But think about it. They've been, they've been basically at the mercy of the ocean for, or of the, of the sea for two weeks now. So we shouldn't be surprised that they're so far, so far off the path that they were hoping to take. And the natives showed us unusual kindness for they kindled the fire and made us all welcome because of the rain that was falling and because of the cold. So a, a reminder that it's winter time, right? So it's, it's cold and rainy. But when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. So when the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, no doubt this man is a murderer, whom, though he has escaped the sea, yet justice does not allow to live. But he shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. However, they were expecting that he would swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But after they had looked for a long time and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. So uh, natives, the natives of Malta, literally in the Greek, is, it's uh, varva, you know, varvari, barbarians, which means that they didn't speak uh, the Greek language, which at that time was like the standard of culture. So, uh, so St. Luke says, even though they were basically barbarians, they showed a lot of hospitality. You know, they, they tried to take care of these 276 people who had washed up onto the shore. Notice here too, right? St. Paul, these people are alive because of St. Paul. And yet when there's work to be done, St. Paul doesn't sit around waiting for someone else to do it, right? Like he goes and gathers the sticks to feed the fire. Um, he's not waiting to be served. He's serving others, which is, again, the example that our Lord gave us in his life. And now he's, he's living it out too. But while he's carrying these sticks and putting the sticks on the fire, because of the heat of the fire, a snake emerges from this from the wood pile. And the word viper there is not necessarily like our modern species of viper that we, but the implication is that it's a poisonous snake. That's the implication. It comes out of the wood pile and it bites St. Paul on the hand. So the natives there, they see this and they're like, oh, this guy's doomed, right? He's, he's going to die for sure. This is a poisonous snake. They knew that those kinds of snakes were, were lethal, that a bite from that kind of snake was lethal. Now, one thing we have to know from the, ancient, the ancients is that they were very oftentimes very superstitious. So when they see, you know, this man survives a shipwreck and now he's going to die by this, you know, basically freak accident, getting bit by a poisonous snake on land they're like oh man this guy must have done something really bad you know that that fate has chased him down finally you know that after all this after surviving all that trouble at sea now he gets to land and now the snake's gonna kill him um and yet as we saw saint paul you know just kind of like shakes it off you know he shakes it off into the fire kill you know the snake dies in the fire like it's no big deal you know it's like uh, and and so they're waiting for him to like just keel over and he never does uh, so now, again, they're superstitious, right? Well, oh, the only way, the only way for someone to get bit by that kind of snake and live, he must be a god, right? Like if he, if he's, if he's, if he didn't die from that, like he must not be, he must not even be human. He must be a god. While they're off base, obviously in their belief or their perception that Saint Paul's a god, uh, Saint Paul serves a god, right? Like Saint Paul is blessed by God uh, as one of his faithful servants. So as such. God protects him, not just on, on the seas, but on land as well. Uh, from the end of uh, the Gospel of St. Mark, we read, right, they will take, Christ now is describing all the things that his servants, you know, his disciples will be able to do. It says they will take up serpents, right? If they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. So St. Paul now fulfills, fulfills, fulfills the words of Christ here that, you know, he handles this uh, poisonous snake and nothing happens to him. <clears throat> in that region, there was an estate of the leading citizen of the island, whose name was Publius, who received us and entertained us courteously for three days. Now, this probably wasn't the whole cohort of 276 people, but probably the centurion, you know, the Roman soldiers and, and, and their prisoners. 
And it happened that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and dysentery. Paul went into him and prayed, and he laid his hands on him and healed him. So when this was done, the rest of those on the island who had diseases also came and were healed. They also honored us in many ways, and when we departed, they provided such things as were, nece excuse me, as were necessary. So St. Luke now recounts to us some miracles that St. Paul's doing. Um, painting for us again the picture, right? That God works through this man, right? This is a vessel. This is a vessel of the grace of God. This is a channel that God works through. And he's not a criminal, right? Like St. Luke is very clearly painting for us a picture right? that this man is an innocent man, right? He's not, he's not a criminal. He's not dangerous as, as the world around him was trying to paint him and make him out to be. Notice the difference, too, of how God works through St. Paul and how those works are received here compared to how those works were received in other parts of Paul's ministry, right? So like, I think I remember like the, in Derby, St. Paul heals a paralytic and at first they worship him as a God and then they come and attack him and beat him and try to kill him, right? Like it's, in the end, he's rejected. Here, the, you know, Publius's father is healed and all oh, the whole island comes out, you know, anyone who was sick and had diseases, everyone comes out to be healed by St. Paul. And what do they do? They honor him. They bring, you know, they, they honored him in many ways. They provided gifts for them um, to continue them along on their journey. So they, they showed hospitality to St. Paul and his companions by, on the beach the night that they washed ashore, you know, the day they washed ashore. And in return, they received God's blessings through St. Paul. And in return, they honored St. Paul and God right through St. Paul. Because when you honor a saint, you honor God as, as well. It's kind of like the, uh, the gospel passage for Sunday, right? Like when you do something to someone else, you do it to Christ, whether that's good or bad. Um, we see Christ in the other. So uh, everything that they had lost in the shipwreck, you know, you can imagine that everything was kind of restored, restored to them by the people of, uh, of Malta. So verse 11, after three months, so they stay there for three months through the winter. That's the idea, right? They stay through the winter. After three months, we sailed in an Alexandrian ship whose figurehead was the twin brothers, which had wintered at the island. And landing at Syracuse, we stayed three days. From there, we circled around and reached Regium. And after one day, the south wind blew. And the next day, we came to Pudioli, where we found brethren and were invited to stay with them seven days. And so we went toward Rome. And from there, when the brethren heard about us, they came to meet us as far as Appii Forum and Three Inns. When Paul saw them, he thanked God and took courage. So they, they find a new ship to take them up, you know, to, towards Rome. And on the, on the front of the ship, there was there like a sculpture of the two, the two brothers, the twin brothers. The twin brothers were sons of Zeus. Well, they were believed to be in that, that time, sons of Zeus, Castor and Pollux. Castor and Pollux are super important in like the legends surrounding the founding of Rome. And they were believed to be protectors of, and sailors. So St. Luke probably includes this detail for his Roman readers, right? His pagan readers reading this to say like, oh, look, even by your standards, right? St. Paul was like, you know, the, you know, St. Paul was like, oh, look at this, right? St. Paul was blessed even by your standards, you know, that he had Castor and Pollux watching out over him. Obviously, St. Luke doesn't see any value in Castor and Pollux being on the boat. He includes the detail again for his, probably for his pagan readers. Because um, again, they're superstitious. So, oh, St. Paul's on a boat with Castor and Pollux, like the blessings, right? It's, it's, a, it's like a happy coincidence. <clears throat> Syracuse is in Sicily, southern part of Italy. So they're starting to get closer. Regium is like on the other side, like if you go around the, the island there, it's like on the southern tip of the boot of Italy, right? Italy's shaped like a boot, like on the southern tip there. And then they get, finally, they get favorable winds and they make their way to Pudioli, which is just southeast of Rome, right? So they're very close now. And there they find a Christian community. They stay there for seven days with them. So um, it just shows us again, right, that We've been tracking St. Paul and his, his work in the churches that he's founding, but there's more going on, right? Like St. Paul gets to this place and it's not like 
uh, like a pagan wasteland. He gets there and there's already Christians there. Uh, so that means that either an apostle had gone there or somebody who had heard the teachings of an apostle and had accepted Christ had gone there. Um, but there was already Christians there. So there were, you know, all throughout the empire, there were these Christian churches that were being planted and, and blossom, blossoming, not just by St. Paul, but by all the, the apostles and, and, and the new disciples too that were being coming to faith through them or going then and preaching as well. Even as they're approaching Rome, you know, they find Christians who, who welcome them, um, which shows us again that even though he's been slandered in every turn and even though his work has been questioned time and time and again, that the church at large accepted St. Paul's work and his preaching, right? Like they're, he's, when they hear that St. Paul is coming, they, they come out and meet him and welcome him and they travel with him towards Rome. So when St. Paul experiences this love from the Christian brethren, it gives him courage and he gives thanks to God again. Now, when we came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard, but Paul was permitted to dwell by himself with the soldier who guarded him. So, <clears throat> excuse me, they finally make it to Rome. And while there, uh, St. Paul basically lives under house arrest, but he enjoys relative freedom. You know, usually prisoners would have two guards. St. Paul only has one. He's allowed to, you know, have visitors. He's allowed to write, you know, letters and send letters and receive communications from others. So this again shows us that the Romans did not consider him dangerous, right? If they thought he was a threat, you know, a political threat or, you know, someone who could stir up unrest and riots and things like that, they would not allow him to have conversations with others. They would not allow him to communicate with others. Uh, they would have him under strict supervision, probably in the barracks. And yet none of this is the situation for St. Paul. So it shows us again that the Romans don't see him as any, anyone dangerous. And it came to pass after three days that Paul called the leaders of the Jews together. So when they had come together, he said to them, men and brethren, though I have done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans, who when they had examined me wanted to let me go, because there was no cause for putting me to death. But when the Jews spoke against it, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, not that I had anything of which to accuse my nation. For this reason, therefore, I have called for you to see you and speak with you, because for the hope of Israel, I am bound with this chain. So as he's done throughout his ministry, right? Who's the first group that he reaches out to? The Jewish authorities, right? He's, he's, he's following his, his MO. Uh, and he wants to touch base with them basically to, to clear his name, you know, and to say like, you know, I haven't done anything wrong. Um, Rome had an established Jewish community. They did not always have the best relations with the, with Roman authorities. You know, we heard earlier in Acts about you know, Emperor Claudius exiling the Jews from the city. Uh, so now we can see that the Jews are back in Rome. Um, and St. Paul is now meeting with them as well. He says that basically, uh, sorry, I want to get the wording right. Um, for this reason, I have been called uh, for you to see you and speak to you with you because for the hope of Israel, I am bound by these chains. So he's, what he's saying is that I'm being imprisoned because of our hope for the Messiah and the resurrection of the dead, which are fulfilled in, in Jesus Christ. So he's going to use this meeting as an opportunity not to preach to them about who he believes is the Messiah, um, who obviously is Jesus. Then they said to him, we neither received letters from Judea concerning you, nor have any of the brethren who, who came reported or spoken any evil of you. We desire to hear from you what you think, for concerning this sect, we know that it is spoken against everywhere. So the Jewish leaders claim that they've never heard anything about St. Paul. So they are willing to listen to him, right? They want to hear him out, even though they've heard negative things about Christianity. You know, you can, you can tell here, they're basically saying that throughout the whole Jewish world, Christianity is, you know, spoken ill against. Um, but what it shows us, right, is that the, the disciples of Christ were making waves. You know, they were making an impact. They were known, you know, their, their work was known everywhere that they went. Um, and throughout that whole, the whole, whole of the empire, 
you know, people knew, who, the Jews knew who the Christians were. Maybe some of the pagans didn't know who the Christians were, but certainly the Jewish communities knew who the Christians were and what they taught. So when they had appointed him a day, many came to him at his lodging, to whom he explained and solemnly testified of the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus from both the law of Moses and the prophets, from morning till evening. And some were persuaded by the things which were spoken, and some disbelieved. So speaking to the Jews, as we've seen, right, who does he, what does he use as the basis of his arguments? Moses and the prophets, right? He's showing them, like, this is what Moses said. This is what the prophet said. This is what happened in the life of Jesus. Look, this is the fulfillment of what was spoken. Trying to show that Jesus is indeed the Messiah. Um, as we've seen, even from the time of Christ himself and throughout this book, right? Some believe and some do not, right? There's, there's, uh, there's a division there among the Jewish authorities. So we're in verse uh, chapter 28, verse 25 here. So when they did not agree among themselves, they departed after Paul had said one word. So they're about to leave, and St. Paul gets the last word in here. The Holy, Spirit, the Holy Spirit spoke rightly through Isaiah, the prophet to our fathers, saying, Go to this people and say, Hearing you will hear and shall not understand, and seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull, their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts in turn, so that I should heal them all, so that, so that I should heal them. Therefore, let it be known to you that the salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will hear it. And when he had said these words, the Jews departed and had a great dispute among themselves. So St. Paul quotes here, like the parting shot, St. Paul quotes Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 through 10. <clears throat> St. Paul reminds them of this vision and prophecy of Isaiah to let them know, right, that those who reject the message that St. Paul preaches are fulfilling that passage of scripture, right, that they have now heard and they haven't, uh, they didn't understand, they have open eyes and they didn't see, right, so they're, I mean, because of that, they're not able to turn and be healed, they're not able to turn and face God properly, and what they've done, what they're doing is they're leaving those blessings for the Gentiles, who hearing will hear and will accept the gospel and receive those blessings from God. So he says this as something to stick in their minds and to call them to repentance, right? Don't be stubborn, you know, don't, don't fulfill this negative prophecy and fall into this category of being reject, you know, God rejecting, healing you. Well, actually it's not even that it's not allowing God to heal you because you've turned away, you know, repent, come to faith in the Messiah. Like we've always waited for and be saved. And now we'll finish off the Acts of the Apostles, these last two verses. Then Paul dwelt two whole years in his own rented house and received all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concerned the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no one forbidding him. So even under guard, right, St. Paul's work spreading the gospel remains unhindered. He has, you know, he's fulfilled everything, uh, all works dedicated to God. He's fulfilled everything. And now he's in Rome as he intended, preaching and teaching and meeting with people. And just like he would have in any of his other missionary journeys, just that this time they have to come to him, right? He can't, he's not free to go to them, but they can come to him. And so he's, he's bringing people to faith, even in Rome, even under, even under house arrest. So, um, some historians believe that St. Paul was released, right? That St. Paul at first was indeed released and that he was a free man for a time. But then during the reign of the emperor Nero, uh, the first official persecution of the Christians began and the emperor Nero ha had St. Paul arrested and eventually executed um, by beheading along with, uh, not simultaneously, but the saint peter also dies during the during the same time in rome so uh those details are not included because for saint luke you know the details the book is not about saint paul right the book is about the acts of the apostles not the acts of saint paul uh, and it's to show that the work of the church even after saint paul died went on right like the that the end the end of this <clears throat> chapter and the end of the book of the acts of the apostles 
shows that the work of the church was ongoing, right? St. Paul's work was ongoing, that his, you know, the disciples that he was, that he was uh, cultivating were going and spreading and that the work of the church everywhere was continuing, right? So the last, really the last word of the Acts of the Apostles is not what happens to Paul, right? That eventually he's martyred in Rome and dies as a martyr. The last thing, of the last part of the Acts of the Apostles is actually the church today, right? We have, a, we have a continuation. There's a continuation in the life of the church from the things that we have been reading about in this book, from chapter one to chapter 28, all the way to our, our modern day times, right? And the, continu the continuity consists, first of all, of this same preaching that St. Paul is doing in Rome. That content hasn't changed, right? He's preaching the kingdom of God and the things about Jesus. That content hasn't changed from that time until today, right? We still preach those same things, and that's the core teachings of our church. Like when we, when we talk about, when we say the creed, which is the creed is the symbol of faith, literally 80 60 percent of it is about the things about jesus and it talks about the kingdom that is to come right like it's literally the same thing that we're talking about in our church today is what saint paul was preaching back then so from that time until today it wasn't just peter and the and the apostles and paul there's the saints that come after them right you have like justin martyr saint ignatius saint irenaeus saint polycarp there's all those early apostolic fathers and then you have saint constantine and the you know the christian era and all the saints that come in that time and saint anthony and you have saints that come after them and saint gregory palamas in the 14th century and you have all the saints again into our modern day times all the saints in, in russia that's you know that suffered under communism that had the ascetic fathers and mothers that are being you know canonized now in our times right there is a continuity that the work that those all these saints have done is is the same thing it consists of the same things that we've been reading about in this book so really the conclusion of the acts of the apostles has not taken place right the acts of the apostles continues in the life of the church the work that they did never stopped still hasn't stopped right we were talking in the pregame show, so to speak, before we started today's Bible study, we were talking about how there are parts in the world where orthodoxy is growing exponentially, right? It's growing really fast. So the work that St. Paul did back way back when is still taking place today throughout the world. And we pray and <clears throat> hope and pray that we can have the strength from God and the grace from God to continue doing that work throughout our own lives and, and, and to future generations. And, and until the second coming, right? Like really the end of the Acts of the Apostles is at the, at the day of, of Christ, you know, is revelations, you know what I mean? Like St. Paul, like if you think about the New Testament, you have the four gospels, four gospel books, you have the Acts of the Apostles, then you have all the apostolic letters, which are these people who we read about, and you know, St. Paul, St. Peter, St. John, St. James, Jude, all these people we've read about in this book, that's all their letters to their disciples. And then what's the next thing? Revelation, right? So we're in this, we're still in this era of the, the, the work of the Acts of the Apostles. And that won't stop and that won't end until the time that Christ returns and the age ends and then the kingdom comes once and for all. So with that, I conclude, <laughs> I conclude my remarks on the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, are there any questions, not just about this chapter is in what we read, but about book in general or anything that's on your minds. Paul has got one. Um, yes, Paula. This, this is minor, but I got to ask. So in chapter 28, verse 25, mm -hmm. um, it says uh, Paul had said one word and there's a lot of words. It, they didn't mean it literally. One no, word. I think what that what that means there is right like. Oh, let me leave you with a word, right? Let, let me let me say yeah. one final, like let me get the last word, right? Like I think that's what it's. I think that's the implication, right? It's not like he said, you know, let, Paul said one word, goodbye. You know what I mean? I think it's like you know, he had, he said the last. He had the last word basically, and that's what he said. That's what he told them. That was his parting, you know, the parting shot. Got it. Thank you. Mm. Thanks for putting on this uh, this Bible study, Father. It's very exciting. You put on a good. Uh, a good study glory to god yeah it's really great glory to god it's not it's not my own I, honestly everything is from other people you know i'm 
Father Stephen de Young's podcast, Father Lawrence Farley's books, The Orthodox Study Bible, um, Saint John Chrysostom. I mean, it's all from it's all from these it's all from these holy people who know better than I do. So I just like to come. I'm a, I'm a journalist by heart, so I just compile all the research and that's good. Put it in a package. So uh, thank you all. I appreciate your attentiveness. May God bless you. Bless us all with a fruitful Lenten season. May we all. Right, repent of our sins and embrace this season of repentance and fasting and prayer and almsgiving so that we can celebrate the Lord's resurrection joyfully together on the great and glorious day of Pascha. Amen. May God bless you all. Kalisara Kusti, blessed Lent.